Let the games begin! We will strike against Ice Crown Citadel. Welcome to the Trials of the Crusader. Hailing from the deepest, darkest caverns of the Storm Peaks, Gormak the Impaler. Battle on, heroes. Here's his health pool, damage range, swing average, and a 14-yard radius hitbox. And these four little balls of fun are his snowballs. Starting off with his damage buff ability, the sequence of snowball grab, launch, and carrier trigger rising anger. This will occur 23 seconds into the fight and every 21 seconds after. This is a buff that increases his damage by 15% for every stack. This applies to all his other abilities as they are physical damage. This should only be able to happen a maximum of four times, unless the snowball jumps back up on the boss if the player is riding dies or something. TBD. On the tail end of the snowball sequence, a random raid member will become a vehicle for a snowballed with snowball carrier. It'll always be positioned behind this player. If they cast, it'll spell lock them for 5 seconds every 8 seconds. It can stun them for 2 seconds every 30 seconds. They cannot be AoE. Cleaving off of them works, cleaving to them doesn't. Position it in the melee stack to capitalize on cleave. For the snowballs that are up on the boss's back, they'll utilize an ability called Firebomb. It'll first happen 10 seconds into the encounter, and will occur roughly every 20 seconds after. At the location of a ranged player, it'll do an 8 yard splash of damage, and leave behind a 5 yard placed AoE fire. Standing in the fire, you will acquire a 20 second debuff that stacks. The fire puddle lasts for 45 seconds. The amount of firebombs going out is dependent on the amount of snowballs on his back. Gormok's signature ability, Impale. This ability is applied every 11 seconds and lasts for 40. This is an instant attack that doesn't reset his melee swings and applies a damage over time on the tank that ticks for every two seconds. And stacks. Two tanks in rotation can taunt off after three stacks of each other, or you can bop cancel, shield cancel to remove the debuff altogether at whatever stack count you deem necessary. This does snap the damage stack from Rising Anger. His third ability, Staggering Stomp. This occurs 16 seconds into the fight, and almost exactly every 21 seconds after. This is a 15 yard physical damage AoE that has a 20 yard AoE interrupt. It has a half second cast, and it does reset the boss's melee swing timer. The AoE, however, is not mitigated by armor, and also benefits from rising anger. This fight is more or less a DPS check. Acid Maw and Dread Scale. They have the same health, the same damage, and the same swing average. Their hitbox is dependent on what state they're in, as well as their abilities. The two states are known as Mobile and Cecil, which can also be referred to as Anchored. The Mobile hitbox is 15 yards, the Anchored hitbox is 8 yards. Their abilities are very similar in the Mobile and the Anchored state. The difference is the debuff that they leave when they use Spray or Bite. The Mobile Worm will apply the debuff through Bite to the main tank. The Anchored Worm will apply the debuff to a randomly selected person in anyone 10 yards around them with the ability Spray. In relation to the order in which you will see these abilities, Dreadscale Mobile will use Burning Bite with a 6 second grace in 16 second intervals on the main tank applying Burning Bile, a debuff pulsating fire damage every 2 seconds to anyone within 10 yards. This cleanses Paralytic Toxin, which in this phase would be applied by the Anchored Acid Maws Paralytic Spray, an AoE at the location of a random raid member that fans out 10 yards, applying Paralytic Toxin to all those affected. A minute long debuff that ticks every 1.5 seconds, that reduces your movement speed by 10% every tick, making you completely immobile after 15 seconds. The damage over time effect also increases multiplicatively by 5% every tick. After a submerged transition, an Anchor Dread Scale will apply Burning Bile through Spray, a mobile Acid Maw will apply Paralytic Toxin through Bite. One interesting thing to note, if Paralytic Toxin is reapplied to somebody who already has Paralytic Toxin, it will reset the movement speed reduction and default back to its initial damage. Now for the shared mobile and shared anchored abilities. The only variance in these is going to be whether it is nature or fire. For mobile, you have Spew, 10 second grace, 20 second interval. This is a 55 yard, 90 degree frontal cone that ticks 10 times over 2.5 seconds. This should never be faced toward the raid under any circumstance. And it'll tickle your tank a bit, but has a long enough interval that you can safely move the boss wherever between casts. The bites that apply the debuffs and slime pull. 
a tiny puddle that grows to a 23 yard radius over the course of a minute. With the initial delay in its cast, and the time before the first submerge, this becomes a non-factor for cleaving depending on your positioning. For the anchored chair abilities, Spit, a ranged auto attack on the highest threat target, Spray, which applies to debuffs, and Sweep, a 15 yard AoE that knocks players back 8 yards. A physical AoE that does not get mitigated by armor. When one of them dies, the other will enrage, increasing all their damage done by 50%. Either option is viable. Acid Last requires a prop pound and tanking with a defined shield cancel ready for the last toxin applied. Dread Scale Last risks the melee having to run out. Though the spray increases in damage, the burning bile does not. Even without benefiting from the buff, it is extremely deadly if not handled appropriately. This is a comfort ability call. Choose what appeals to your raid more. And the final boss of the Beast of Northrend, Ice Howl. His hitbox radius is 17 yards, which comes in handy with his ability, Whirl. This is a 15 yard physical AoE that will knock anyone hit by it back 30 yards. The way to handle this is to position the tank in a crevice where he will not be knocked back, and for the melee to be at max melee range so the ability will never affect them. His second ability, Ferocious Butt, is a hard hitting stun he will apply to the highest threat target in his melee range. His third ability, Arctic Breath, he will snap target a random raid member, dead center from that person's direction, in a 90 degree frontal cone 100 yards out. Everyone in that affected area will be stunned and damaged over time during the duration of the channel. This can be broken early if the person he is targeting for this ability has some form of stun removal applied to them. And lastly is Massive Crash. In the span of two seconds, he will jump to the center of the room and slam into the ground. This will knock every player in the arena against the wall relative to the center of the room stunning them for 6.5 seconds. He will then jump back and prime the ability Trample, a 12 yard radial AoE centered on him. As the stun wears off, he will begin charging at the location a player was previously stunned. If no players cross this hitbox by the time he hits the wall and goes into the daze animation, thumbs up, all's well. If, however, somebody does get within 12 yards of him before he hits the wall. They will almost certainly be killed, as this immediately snaps the buff from Frothing Rage, which increases damage, attack speed, and movement speed by 100%, on top of the 50k damage that Trample inflicts. But that's not the worst part. It's the 15 seconds of damage you would have gotten from Staggering Days that is now essentially lost. You can de-enrage the Frothing Rage and attempt to avoid further Tramples. After the 15 seconds of Staggering Days, he will Arctic Breath shortly after coming out of it. You continue on this trend until you kill him. If he is still alive by the end of the fourth massive crash, he will go into a Berserk, which is a 500% damage increase flat. If this happens, you have one shot to get him into his Staggering Days and kill him before he is free out of that stun. As a Berserk Amplified Breath or Whirl will one-shot anyone. Before I unfurl this next demo, I would like to show you the limits of the abuse you can take from Burning Spray and Burning Bile in stacks, pertaining to an anchored dread scale. Spray in and of itself isn't a huge concern, and even with Burning Bile not being able to be empowered by the Enrage effect, anything beyond four pulsating to each other is insanity. The demonstration is going to show how to handle Acid Mod Dread Scale safely, quote unquote safely. It adheres to two to a stack. You can do three. Back here are some pictures of it being done with three. Here's a picture where you can have melee groups be in the safe zone where they get knocked back and not attribute any spreading of a debuff to anyone that is in a range pile. Although it is entirely possible to spread up before the first pulsate happens with four in a stack, it's not likely, don't count on it if it's not a super coordinated group. It is possible for four people to survive four pulsates or mastery desac power word shield. But if they don't get something by the time there's a second tick, they're very likely to die. And in most cases, when four people do tick each other, it's going to look like this. Two to a group is baby mode where power word shield is debatably needed. Three to a group, definitely needed. Four, everything. Here's the demo. As I have witnessed this on my alts, it is a very common hindrance and ends up crippling the group by the time it gets to Ice Howl. There is a safer way to handle this than what is currently considered the commonly applied strat. Referring to the Zug one down. This is the safest way to deal with the Jermunger twins. Position your melee on the mobile worm. Put them in three groups. You can do this with four, but let's keep it simple with three for this demonstration, because cardinal directions are easier to translate. With melee never being near the anchored worm, Whirl will never be a factor knocking them into groups of range, causing a cascade of five plus getting the debuff. The range can swap between either, regulating how much damage either one is taking. After they submerge, the melee will then go to the one that is also mobile, working Acid's health down to a level that Threat Scales is currently at. At current content gear, they both should die in this phase. Lower gear, you might have one more submerge. 
With this strat, you should always have an answer to the opposite debuff and should never be in a position to compromise the lives of those around you. Surviving the spew, this lines up shortly after getting the first set of paralytic toxins in the second. Avoid walking in front of the boss while he is spewing. I know you want to clench your debuff. There's also a slime pool to worry about that's directly underneath him. Be cognizant of his cast bar. Don't go up there until it is completely done casting. Or wait for your tank to make a call for you to come get cleansed. Three second cast is not a long wait. So it is over, the tank is free to move to whoever has the paralytic toxin. If they so choose to do so. From the tank, the 10 yard pulse every two seconds. You go to them or they come to you. Just as long as there is no spew. When acid is mobile, the only sketchy part will be when your tank gets a paralytic toxin. There may exist a window where he is frozen. Waiting for someone with the burning body to come cleanse him. During this time, you can have your second tank tank him. If you're worried about them having threat on the anchor dread scale, you shouldn't. Nobody should be focusing this worm. And even if, say, a healer or a caster gets threat, he doesn't do enough damage that it is a threat for them to tank it and be healed through it. If you have so much melee that you need to put some on the anchored worm, you can accommodate range positioning so that they don't get flung into them. Or just have the excess melee stand out of the fight for that phase. The only other real threats to this encounter, on Gormok, CDs have to be lined on tanks when he is at 3-4 stacks of rising anchor. The common death for tanks is an impale lining with a main hand swing. The majority of the other factors are self-accountability. Avoid standing in bad. Ostracize the bile when it's not needed for cleansing. Avoid being trampled. Avoid needless damage. Good luck to you if you are on this obscene quest to get this very annoyingly hard to get mount. Because even if you're on point with everything, there is a non-zero chance that faction champions is going to say no. Shout out to the Hunter, Rogue, Red Pout, and Combo. Is it over? No. So these videos take an astronomical amount of effort to get to an accurate point. Whether it be punching in expressions in the replace function in Notepad+, gathering all that ranged data from logs, analyzing each ability, documenting the nuance with those abilities, verifying visual data with VODs and YouTube videos, on top of the plethora of actor movement in Blender, and the amount of time I spent figuring out Blender to do it slightly better than I have been. I'm failing to mention half the stuff that makes this more hectic. My point is, blood, sweat, and passion goes into this. I'm just gonna rip off the band-aid. Do you like this style of content? Would you consider making a contribution to help me make more? <clears throat> it would aid me immensely, and I would be grateful for your consideration. Okay, band is off. I can offer two things to reciprocate gratitude. Firstly being, I can put your handle at the end of the video. There are no strings attached showing thanks in this way. The second thing that I wanted to offer is to put an image that a supporter chooses in the video as one of the actors. Instead of it being a place at the end of the video, it'd be a place throughout. And then I did some Googling. I can only offer this with a profile picture of your character and a nameplate with your handle. There's too much red tape with copyright and too much anxiety on my end for losing my channel if anything goes wrong with it that this is the limitations of what I can offer with this. I do not yet have a process set up to make this doable. It is currently unavailable. But I absolutely can put your handle at the end of the video. If you cannot contribute or do not want to, that is fine. The other route is to make it through YouTube's development stage where I have to meet these metrics and hope for the best when they judge, I guess. So like the video if you like the video. I'm not going to tell you to like something that you don't enjoy. I read your comments. I try to engage as much as I can. These videos take a while to get done. If you don't mind that, and you sub anyway, thank you. There should be links in the description. Uh, wish I was better at segues. Here are the programs and content I have used. I hope that this video has been helpful in some way, and thank you for watching.